speaker is Farouk Derekshani. Now, Farouk has been associated with the Aga Khan Award for Architecture for over 40 years and director of that program since 2006. Now, the Aga Khan Awards were described by Charles Jenks as the best architectural award in the world. I have to say that was before we started WAF in 2008. But I think Charles was, uh, meant, was meant that on several different levels. The first was the quality of the judges, both for the technical and the final juries, always very high caliber. And following on from that was the degree of rigor that they could bring to the assessment and discussion of the entries they saw, which was informed by visits. So every building was visited, on, I think twice, wasn't it, by both juries. So there was always a very informed, very measured uh, level of decision making. But I think most important about why Charles thought this was the best award in the world, at least for the criteria now at WAF, um, was that they stressed how architecture can contribute to specific communities and to a wider culture, which, as I understand it, is in line with many of the Aga Khan's other cultural initiatives. And this fits very closely with our theme this year of Together, well, because almost all the Aga Khan Award winners have as at least part of their scope uh, a, a recognition of how different types of people can live together often while retaining distinct cultural identities. So it's not about complete blending, it's about togetherness in the sense of recognizing difference and allowing that difference not just to coexist, but sometimes to be catalytic. And Farouk is going to, to, to discuss the most recent cycle of awards, which are granted at the end of a three-year cycle earlier this year. Farouk, thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, thanks. It's re uh, sometimes it's very difficult when you think about you working for an organization that's been there for 45 years, that how are you going to introduce it? You hope that everybody knows about it. So if everybody knows about it, why you want to describe it? How, how things? But still, as there's some young people here, I can see a few. Um, I will just go briefly explain how what the award is, what the award is about. And then later, I'm going to explain the, si the six winners of the last 2022 uh, kind of Award for Architecture. And later, probably with Jeremy, we're going to have some discussions about the rationale behind the whole thing. Um, this is our logo. This is a logo that's been uh, known to many people um, uh, by this uh, all these years, because we have been very well covered thanks to all the architecture journals, architecture sites, because there is another way of looking at architecture. That is the, one of the main differences between the Archon Awards for Architecture and many other awards which have been there. Well, I have to just say that, you know, uh, when we're talking, we're talking about uh, 1982, uh, 1977, when the Archon Awards for Architecture was created. At that time, there were not many international awards. There was, in the world of architecture, there was, you know, usually it was among, like, the guilds, you know, RIBA, you would go, and, you know, one year, this, this is this, someone else's turn, and then the other year is the other ones. So you would give the awards to each other, to your friends, and, you know, depend where you are. Um, the award started in 1977 as one of the first international awards, which had really going through other places, going through different disciplines. And one of the things that... Um, uh, as, uh, I mean, kindly Charles Jenks was referring to, is involving people from all around the world and different disciplines. So the whole thing is that architecture is not a work of one person. Architecture, we're looking at architecture as a product and not as a, as a masterpiece. Uh, so that's the whole thing. Is no architect, I think, uh, I mean, that's something one can say very fairly, is responsible totally for a building. It's always, if you don't have a good client, if you don't have a good people who built the building, you have, don't, don't have craftsmen, if you don't have the people, the public, the users, all together working together, you cannot get a good architecture. It is an architecture, maybe it goes in journals, but it's not something which ha makes a change in people's lives. Because when you look at the architecture, it's one of the only disciplines in the world which has an impact on 
most people in the world. Because the other disciplines, you know, we talk about, you know, everything is very important, you do engineering, um, you go to social sciences, you go to economy, etc. It always is for one spe specific group of the society. But architecture does cover all different levels of society, and also different people are involved, from decision makers to the layman. All of them are involved, and, and at the end of the day, those who use and live in the, pro in the buildings, those people also are involved in the architecture and the success of a project. So here we have a system. I'm just going to explain very shortly the system uh, which uh, you refer to. I mean, thanks for you to calling us the Best Architecture Award, so, because I've been in many uh, different uh, fora talking about with different, my different colleagues from different awards, comparing the different awards, which, who's the best. Um, it takes three years. It's a three years process uh, that it was established in 1977 that we have a, in order to make sure that we know the truth. I loved um, the previous um, uh, presenter about truth, lies, in architecture. How can you find the truth in an architecture? How can you just see what's real and what's not? So this is the whole thing that that is the system has been created upon that. So we have a network of some 800 or 1,000 people around the world, which we call them nominators. I mean, it's just, you know, because these are friends and friends of friends, it's people that we know them and they know us. And we try to have them from different disciplines. I mean, being architects, academics, uh, people in practice, uh, and journalists, uh, different people who are involved in the built environment. So we ask them to nominate projects. Of course, people themselves can also send their projects, but do not automatically show these um, projects to the jury. Um, then uh, the, uh, we do have a documentation period. So the, uh, the eligibility criteria for the Arkan Award for Architecture is that building has to be completed in use for a minimum one year and maximum six years. This is what has been uh, we're looking at. It has to be, um, and the, this is the uh, rule one. Then rule two is that it has to be a service to the Muslim community. That's because of the Aga Khan himself, that he is responsible for, you know, for his faith. And he was wondering that how we can have an impact on the people who are Muslim society. Coming saying that is that this is not that the Muslims are not don't they're not living in one specific country or one specific regions. They are especially in the past 10, 20, 30, 50 years they've been going everywhere. Be careful, they're coming, huh? So <laughs> um, the, then what we do is that we document the projects. We have come to something like th four, three to four hundred and fifty, five hundred projects every cycle. So it's a three-year cycle. We document them. Uh, and that is where the tr truth and lie comes, lies, because we ask the architects to present their projects. They do present. I mean, one of the best things is that when you go to school of architecture, the first thing they show, teach you is that how to sell your idea. And you put it, how beautiful. And these days, with all these new um, programs that we have, you don't know what's real and what's s surreal. What is the reality? It's very, so we can show and we are known as architects, as a profession, how to explain very well what people don't know what they were gonna get. Because most, in most cases, what you have in mind is not one people at the end get it. So we document it first. The jury goes through these um, 400, 500 um, nominations. They choose um, a number, which are about 20 projects, which we call them shortlist. Shortlists are the projects that we send an expert to go and see the project and then interview the architects, interview the users, interview the other people. Uh, different, I mean, to see what the, the public thinks about the project. There is something very important in architecture is that the sense of what I call it, the sense of belonging. The sense of belonging is that when you go into a building, you go to an architecture, you feel that you belong to that space, and all from outside you can see that that building, that project belongs to that where you are. So this is a very important uh, element, which is not something technical that you can go and you know it, you don't have measurements how you can measure it. You know how how much that sense is is quite difficult. So uh, we send someone to go and see the projects. They have to come up with a. Um, a report which is uh, written, 
Uh, and because uh, in the Arkan Award for Architecture, in a way, you are comparing apples and oranges. One of the contributions which I can say after 40 years that the Arkan Award for Architecture has done has been, I'm not saying that they were the only ones, but has contributed to expanding the understanding of architecture. Because when in the in, up to the 1970s, when I, early 70s, when I was in School of Architecture, you know, we'd all have all these journals, architecture journals, and you would never talk about people. It was always, I mean, maybe, you know, there was one article in AD about, you know, housing for the poor or something written, but there was not much about that. Secondly, there were other disciplines which today become is very normal. Slum upgrading was not considered architecture. It was, you know, it's a development uh, area. Conservation was archaeology. Nothing called conservation didn't mean anything when we were in school. So, um, so the Arkan Wolf Architecture was the first time when it came out. Uh, I mean, it was announced in 1980. They brought together engineering, like water towers in Kuwait, uh, conservation, uh, using of uh, material, local material, and very high technology as well. Putting all these together and, and conservation, then all of a sudden. Um, there was a nine, I mean, after, I mean, you're all young. Those who remember in 1980 when Architecture Record and Domus and all of them they put they published the projects. People were saying, "Oh, come on! How can you have in Architecture Record in US slums in there's a big page of slums in uh, Jakarta?" So this was the whole thing that it was a contribution to, to expanding the understanding of architecture. And again, the one other thing which Jeremy was explaining that from the very beginning we had different kind of people involved. So when you put, um, you know, like let's say in 1980, Kenzo Tange together with uh, Sajid Moko, who was uh, the director of the UN University, etc., put them together, they come with other ideas of architecture, the other understanding. And that is, was the main con contribution that we had. So, um, g going forward from that, that, so we have the people, then we have a second round, which is very important. The reviewers, who are all of them experts in their own field, they come and they present the projects to the jury. So it's not the architects like here that they could present the jury because again, the whole line between the truth and lies becomes very blur. Uh, it is, uh, they, they come and present the jury. So we want, try, want, we want to have is to have the most uh, objective uh, point of view from projects. And because you can write a report, even you try to be very objective, but when you write a report, you know, still, you know, you might omit certain things, you might not say some, or you might forget. So when the jury reads all of them a month in advance, and the person comes there, they might ask questions as, what did you see there? Or what was this? Or what was that? And that's where, hopefully, between the... I love that uh, the story of the uh, truth and uh, lies in architecture. I was just, uh, Richard, I have to thank Richard again, was uh, talking about this before. Um, so that's where we can say the jury decides on what it is. Well, the award is $1 million. That is the total amount, which is divided by six projects, five, six projects at the end. And this is given to, uh, the award is, again, uh, one of it is monetary prize money, and one is a grant. So the prize money goes to the people, to the, not only to architects, it goes to the architects, clients, uh, craftsmen, depending who's, who has had how uh, the percentage of each person's contribution to the achievement of a project. That is, uh, so to the experts, we see that, and that's how they, they work. And then uh, the, the other one is a grant that the winner will get the grant. We put an amount of half of the uh, prize money that they have to disseminate the uh, the um, the why the project won an award. So its achievements have been disseminated. So that is the one of the other things that we have had in the past. Uh, we've been very felt responsible for is how you communicate architecture. Communicating architecture is also another area that, we, with the award, we've been very careful about it, is that by make, having seminars, uh, exhibitions, to explain what it is. Because it's not only through 
images and uh, f uh, written material that you can explain. It has to go far beyond because make it contextualized in that sense. Um, so anyway, then we have another session. The winners are chosen. Then we have a very big event, which these events are the award ceremonies. And from the day one, they were always um, attended by the head of the state. So why? It's not about the, how to just the prestige, because um, when you go to a country, when you have the head of the state coming to an event, all of a sudden the newspapers, the journals, etc., they talk about a topic that usually they don't talk about. Architecture now may become a little bit more a la mode, but in, in the past, it was not something that they would discuss in newspapers, in journals. In the, so, uh, like for example, in 1983, uh, uh, um, our Turkish friends remember when the president of Turkey went from Ankara to Istanbul, they opened the Topkapi Palace for the first time for any event ever. So this had an impact. But at the same time, we had a little problem there because you know, every country wants to have you know, their own football team, and all winners. Uh, there was a non-architect who got an award. So they were coming, uh, th this became a big de debate in, in Turkey. Maybe how can these people come at the same time? You cannot criticize them that they're not architects because they are architects. But how come they're not given an award to someone who's not an architect, especially in Turkey, which is very important to you know, you have all the universities, you have to become a, be an architect, etc. So this is a, just to give you a, it was a little bit long, short introduction to the award. So this cycle, what we did, we had 20 projects. We sent them, uh, these were all around the world, um, mostly, uh, different countries. So that's the distribution of them. And out of these 20 projects, um, six projects uh, uh, were selected as winners. Um, I'm going to go quickly through those six projects to explain to you what it is. Um, sometimes we've been accused that where the Arkan Award for Architecture is going, and what is not having uh, uh, bold projects anymore. But we have had in the past, we've given uh, awards to, the, as I said, the, the Kuwait uh, um, Water Towers, we've given it to Petronas Towers, we've given it to um, Fry Otto and many sections. So it is not, the whole thing is that it's not for cute architecture. We are not giving an award for cute architecture. That's, that's what I'll, I'll assure you. There's a meaning to each of these projects. Um, here we have got uh, six projects, which uh, the first one is in Tehran, my home country. Um, it is a foundation, it's a brewery. So. This is having a new life for buildings. So uh, as you can imagine, how many, when we were just talking about the uh, bank, which was turned into a, a museum, how many buildings have now, they could not fit the functions they've had. They have to come with a new function, a new building. And here it was the ruins. Actually, there was a, beer, uh, a brewery in the middle of Tehran, before the revolution and before that they closed all the breweries. They had to move it out because uh, breweries make a lot of smell and it's not good for the environment. So they had to move in 19, late, late uh, 1960s. So, but the person who owned the factory uh, has to, didn't need the money, so he left it. And after the revolution, he just, it was left, and it was coming like a, it's uh, the whole collapsing. And this is one of the other things which is important. You have got all around the world a series of architecture which is done by non-architects or architects. You can imagine that the Germans, who um, probably they were Germans, who were specialists in breweries. So they would go and build these same almost kind of, a, because it was a, it's, a, it's a machine, it's a kind of a, so you, you, you're having a building as a machine to work to, to some very purpose. So they had this. Now, in, nine, in uh, five, six years ago, an uh, art collector, he purchased the land. It's a small project. And an architect put up a roof as a hat on top of that project. So here you can see the before and after uh, of, the, of the building. And it's created a space that people go in in Tehran. It's very vivid, this, uh, this space. But it has also what did something important to create spaces high enough for contemporary art. Because usually most of the buildings, when you have them, you um, tra tra 
transform them, they cannot contain installations. So it is a, it's not a huge place. So he has done very well, this architect, between the new and the old. It's very, you can see that how he's uh, de dealt with the building as it was, the ruins and the non-ruins, everything is there. At the same time, very boldly has added these things. Now, a, f a s small anecdote, how an architect works. Um, in my country, in Iran, there's something called sanctions. You know, probably you've heard the word sanctions. And then you think that how sanctions work for architecture. So they had, what they had, because uh, the roof, as you can see, is floats. So as a structure engineer, we come up with a, a, a steel structure. So they were doing it. They did half of it. All of a sudden, without the sanctions, you could not bring the steel anymore. There was that kind of specific ones. So they had to change in the middle of the pro project, go back to concrete. So this is the whole thing of the adaptability, how you can adapt yourself to the things. And these are one of the areas that architecture is not something fixed. It's something that has to be readapted and rethought as it goes on and the buildings continue. Um, we're talking about um, recent heritage. Recent heritage is something today is becoming more, more and more evident. In a lot of countries, whatever was coming from um, colonial period, etc., was seen as colonial and as bad. It took 50 years and oh, 50, 60 years for people to reconcile with the heritage, our recent heritage, be it colonial, be it modernist or not. So this is a um, most of you know the Oscar Nemaya's one of the projects that he's done that was never finished in Lebanon. Uh, this is in Tripoli. In Tripoli, there was a fair, and this fair was by uh, it was never completed. It was some of them used? It was uh, if one part of it has been constructed, uh, re renovated, and it's turned into workshops for. Uh, carpenters, which is in Tripoli, carpentry is a very important industry. So this whole thing of recon again coming back and having the, um, the, the our heritage that because not Oscar Neymar's building is a part of the heritage of Tripoli, and that was very important. How you can bring back and give that? Um, it's not a matter of nostalgia, but it's a matter of that uh, uh, the la different layers of one's identity, which is comes. Um, this is uh, as we can see. This is, this is a very small. Uh, I hope it works. Uh, the, the, uh, you can see the, the uh, dark one is the building which has been restored. The rest of it is a huge building, has not been restored. It, hopefully, by g getting an award, there were some initiatives that it can be re uh, happen. Um, we have another project, which is uh, these housing for uh, these uh, uh, complexes, uh, centers for the Rohingya. The Rohingya, well, uh, you all know, in a matter of a month, one million people moved. And refugee, the whole thing with refugees has got a number of things. First, they all come in a mass. Second, no, no government wants to have anything to keep them forever there. So there's something called per, uh, temporary. Uh, but as all you know, there's nothing more, um, uh, I would say, exists with, with states there that, that temporary. Temporary is not, not a word, it's just, it's, it will be stay forever, but the governments will not do. So you're not allowed to build in materials which are there. But one of the things important is that in the refugee camps, what you have is the women are the ones who are suffering most people because they're, you know, un unfortunately, you know, in these, these kind of con conditions, they need safe heavens. So here there was this, and they have to do it very fast. So a group of young architects, they went on six different um, uh, places. They built together with the refugees some safe havens for the women. So these are places are for women, it's run by the women, and they, they, it is, you know, the centers in these uh, camps. Another thing which is very important that they've done here is that when the refugees go to one area, usually the villagers and the people who are in that area, they feel that some other people are coming, they are getting all the money, they are getting everything, they were not getting anything. So here, they were very keen on how to do it, to work also with the villages which were there. So these are the six, the same group of architects, but different architectures they've done. Um, here we have got another uh, um, project from Bangladesh. I don't know why we have two in Bangladesh, but we have two winners from Bangladesh. And uh, this one is a 
a couple, a young architects couple, they went to this, their hometown in Bangladesh and they started working with the people with being cooperative and working with the uh, uh, municipality and to create public spaces. These are kind of, a, I'm, I'm not going to use the word activist architects, but the people who are going and creating projects from, from themselves because you have to create projects. The days that the architects had to sit down and wait for commissions to come is gone. As an architect, one has to go in the field and create your own projects to be able to design them. Um, here we have, and here also they, they brought this, um, I mean, it's a very complex project uh, that you can see that in the books that we have uh, later. So this is the public spaces that they created uh, very closely. Um, here we have in um, Indonesia an airport, which is a, it's a green airport. It's not only green because it's got a green uh, a roof, but the person, the, the, the visionary um, uh, governor, he wanted not to repeat what had happened in Bali. So tourism comes. I mean, the, in the name of ecotourism, everybody goes there, but the whole thing has been ruined totally. So here he've come up with an, uh, with an airport, which in this airport, there are no shops. No shops in the airport because they want the people to come there and go to the village and buy things from the villagers. So it's a small airport, of course, uh, but it is a, I mean, it's, we've, we've had this kind of airports which, you know, you go in and, you know, you're in the nature, it's not air conditioned, etc. But this is done and it's been inspired by um, the, the local architecture. Um, Andre Martin, who's the architect of this project, he's one of those people who've really built a lot. He's, he's a very good architect. He's built 1,000 projects. This is 1,001, I think, and this is number 1,000. Um, and then coming back again to the projects we are saying that you go as an architect and you create a, 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 the opportunity to build is a group of um, young architects from Barcelona, a very responsible. They had gone to uh, Senegal for vacation, that they felt that they could do something. They went back to Barcelona, they created the foundation, collected money, and they went back to, this, uh, to Casamance, which is an area which is in, in um, um, Senegal, which is not very well uh, treated by the local uh, central government. They created a school, which is uh, the this, uh, this school that they have done with these techniques with walks and collecting uh, water. Uh, as you can see, that they are from Barcelona because they've got a little bit of Gaudi there as well. But, but they have done very well. The, the whole landscaping is perfectly done. Um, this is a school and uh, this is. So these six projects are the project for the 2022 have been the winners. And I hope that they will be a good thing. Um, usually, uh, architecture is very good to do it. So we always publish a book. We uh, explain all these things in, in the book. And as you can see, Jeremy, it's called inclusive architecture. That's something, so togetherness and inclusiveness is one of the most aspects. Thank you very much. very well demonstrates the breadth of, of projects you get involved with, the breadth of location. Ah, oh, we have to use the, it, okay. it's okay, no, fine. Okay, sorry, I, I was just saying... You, you, need, you, you need to do that, that do because I, of that, yeah. I mean, okay, right. I was saying I, I thought it was uh, a, a very good exposition of the breadth of projects, the breadth of locations, the breadth of, of, of architects, communities that you work with, from clearly... Um, you know, relatively well-off communities to very poor communities, such as those in Bangladesh. But also, I think, interestingly, at one level, there's an Oscar Niemeyer building in there. Okay, a re, uh, rehabilitation of it. But this isn't just purely about pushing Islamic architecture. And I suspect that you would feel very uncomfortable about saying what this is about, you know, discovering a new sort of Islamic architecture. What you're doing is discovering a new sort of architecture. First of all, I never ever yeah. use the word Islamic architecture. Yeah. You, you don't have Christian architecture. You have uh, Islamic architecture is a word, I mean, it's a term which unfortunately has been used uh, in by academia, the Western academia, because without knowing um, from Indonesia all the way to Africa, you cannot have anything in common in architecture. Yeah. But what is important is that how you can have 
an architecture for the, the, those people who are live there, who is close to the way of living. And because of the Islam, the faith, it's a lot related to the daily life. That is what is important. Yeah. But, but also, I think, you know, the, the, your, your final comment about inclusiveness is really important. Thinking of those little um, spaces in Bangladesh, in the town yeah. of Bangladesh, you know, it doesn't matter what religion you are, what background you are. This is about what architecture can do almost uniquely at that, at that level of urban design is, is to welcome people. And I think that's a really important part of, of, of what the award's about. And even possibly the airport in Indonesia. Yeah. I mean, I like the idea of having no shops. I think mean, a lot of architects who have designed airports would be very grateful to have no shops. shops. <laughs> um, but I think sending people out to the, to the local village to buy their duty-free or whatever, it yeah. wouldn't be duty-free, of course, but their, um, you know, their, their, their products that they want to take them on the plane is really, really interesting. And it's, as you say, it's a small airport, but it looked like quite a nice one. I mean, it looked like yeah. one that one wouldn't feel, oh my God, here we are again. Um, so I think that that's what, but I think one of the projects that really struck me uh, is the art gallery in uh, Tehran. Now, um, at WAF, it, over many years, we've had really high quality entries from Iran. Sadly, you know, we're not allowed to take entries at the moment from, from Iran. But there is clearly a really strong architectural community in Iran, very talented people. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit about how that project fits into uh, 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 an Iranian architecture. Um, I think it's, it's a part, because one of the things that happened um, in Iran is that, uh, you know, there is something called patronage in architecture, mm. and usually in countries you've got a responsible people are responsible at the government level who can be uh, contribute to as a patronage uh, as by selecting architects by giving architects. Uh, unfortunately, the, in the past forty years, uh, we have not had so, this opportunity, and it's very funny that whenever they want to talk about the architecture of the contemporary architecture of Iran, they show buildings which were built 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, those are the only projects which are so-called. But the public, the people are there. Yeah. That's why the people, the, uh, uh, all the, uh, most of the architecture you can see come from Iran are from uh, private sector. So private sector, and well, like everywhere else, we had, uh, we had the culture of architecture, we had schools of architecture, but now, like anywhere else in the world, they've got hundreds and hundreds of schools of architecture. So there is that culture there. But uh, what is important is that how can architects help the, like, for example, the project in Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. How, you, as an architect, you can go and change the mindset of a decision maker? I think that is key. Yeah, and I think architecture is a very good way of of trying to do that. It's yeah. why you were talking about having the heads of state to the yeah. award ceremony. So yeah. if, if you can get that sort of level of, of attention, yeah. attention, uh, then then you're halfway there to persuading people to think seriously yeah. about architecture. And this is, I think, part of what we're trying to do with WAV, is to say to people, well, obviously, you know, we're primarily a way for architects to talk to each other about what they do, i.e. architecture. But we hope that from that, a whole series of possibilities emerge about what architecture can do yeah. for the, the broader community, whether it's cultural, whether it's economic, whether it's social or whatever. And that's what we focus on with the Web Futures program, which some of you may have seen on the festival called Sage. And I think it's what you do and have been doing for, well, the better part of 50 years now yeah. uh, with, with the other carnivores. And, and you know what we're saying is very important when you have in the judges, we're talking about the judges. Um, uh, when you have architects talking amongst themselves, there's some things which is clear. Okay, you say, nice proportions. The other one will understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You're talking about, so, you know, take but when you have non-architects in the jury, they can ask a question which the, the architects cannot answer. Th then they will think again. And I've seen these uh, very seasoned architects, very famous architects, that they go and then they're confronted. They, they go and push for a project till the last day. And a philosopher will ask a question which would just make them think twice. And that is important. Which reminds me of um, an exchange between Derrida and Peter Eisenman, <laughs> where you know, Eisenman was really keen to hook Derrida into what he thought, or what Eisenman thought deconstruction was. And uh, Derrida just says, well, Peter, 
Have you ever thought about what happens when the telephones go into your building and how many line, telephone lines there are and where all the information comes from? This is long before you know, we had the sort of digital technology we have. And you could almost feel Eisenman shrinking us when <laughs> suddenly he's confronted with you know, a completely different level of deconstruction. Yeah. P P Peter, he was, um, uh, he was on our jury and then committee. And then he, he himself has said that once he was somewhere in New York and they told him, Peter, how can you go with these guys? You've got nothing to do with the Ark on the Water architecture. He said, well, no, you know, I had to go there because Frank Gehry called me and told me that I will learn a little bit if I come to him there. And Frank Gehry himself, he went there because Charles Moore told him to go. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you get into so a cultural chain there, which is, yeah. which is itself quite interesting. And I think um, you know, I'm afraid we're going to have to sort of come to the end yeah. now because we're a little bit up against time. But thank you so much for giving us a really interesting insight into what you do. And I think it really confirms what I'd always agreed with Charles Jenks about, which is that this really is, you know, the best architecture in the world, apart from WAF. Thank you. <laughs>